Good morning. We're going to continue in our series uh, in the book of James this morning, and we're going to be studying uh, the conclusion of chapter 3. Now, some biblical passages uh, address questions and answers that are of particular interest only uh, to Christians. Uh, they're significant only to people who follow Jesus Christ. But today's discussion is not confined to Christian subculture or to theologians because every single person asks the questions that are posed by this text and they answer them in practical ways that define their life. It is hard to find a universal issue that is more essential to human flourishing than what we're going to talk about this morning. So in this text, James asks, who is wise among you? And this raises questions like, what is wisdom? What is its source? How do we attain it? And what kind of life does it produce? He invites us to consider what patterns of behavior and thought demonstrate that a person is wise. This matter is at once both philosophical and deeply personal. So no matter where we begin, we're going to end up in both places. I wonder if you know the literal meaning of the word philosophy. It means a love of wisdom. So a philosopher is a lover of wisdom. For over 2,500 years, the ancient Greek philosophers like Socrates and Plato and others defined that the fundamental task of philosophy was discovering how to become wise. And wisdom reaches far beyond simply knowledge or ideas because it's been defined as the capacity to judge rightly in matters of life and conduct. It's also thought to be something that comprises the knowledge of how to live well and the disposition to act appropriately on that knowledge. So wisdom is truth correctly applied to life. Each human soul is thirsty to know how to live, thrown into the morass of desire and drives, competing loves, unmet longings, pain and pleasure. We seek meaning and strength and sources of wisdom. An honest appraisal of this penetrating question, who is wise, touches you and me where we hope and where we hurt and where we heal. In his novel, Miss Wyoming, Douglas Copeland uh, gives a description of, a, of an individual. And I think this resonates with a lot of us. This person said, Truth be told, the one thing in this world I want more than anything else is a great big crowbar to jimmy myself open and take whatever creature that's sitting inside and shake it clean like a rug and then rinse it in a cold, clear lake. And then I want to put it under the sun and let it heal and dry and grow and sit and come to consciousness again with a clear and a quiet mind. So from the heights of philosophy to the depths of our soul, who is wise and understanding among us? James wants to know, and perhaps some of us do as well. Let's ask the Lord to teach us this morning. Lord, you are the source of wisdom. We have praised you, we have sung to you this morning. Uh, about your mercy. We've heard from Carly about the reality that you are merciful to us. So we come to you this morning and ask Father, Son, Holy Spirit that you would be with us in particular ways that we need uh, in our ignorance, in our lack of understanding, in our weakness, uh, in our rebellion against you. Whatever we bring to you this morning, Lord, please meet us, care for us, teach us, Encourage, convict, and Lord, we need your wisdom, and we ask for it, and you've told us that you'll give generously to those who ask in faith, and we thank you for that. Uh, in Christ's name we pray, amen. So let's turn to James 3, uh, 13 through 18 are the verses that we're going to read. As we've been moving through James on Sunday morning, we're now coming to uh, the conclusion 
of the third chapter. So this is James 3, 13 to 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James places, James places for us, front and center, the theme of wisdom, as he did in the opening section of his letter, where he encouraged us to ask for wisdom, especially in trials, knowing that God will give generously to those who ask in faith. Now, across the pages of the Bible, the Lord has much to say about wisdom. It reveals its source, its beginning point. Psalm 111 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice it have a good understanding. Proverbs 9.10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Proverbs 28.28, 28, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. So wisdom resides in the one who possesses awe and reverence and surrender to the authority, the glory, and the infinite knowledge and power of our Creator God. Fear of God is showing by your trusting and your obedience that, the, that God is your Lord above everything else, even including yourself. As we turn to James to uncover his teaching on wisdom, we want to keep in mind that this section here in chapter 3 fits in to the larger theme of the book. We've entitled our series, Divided Lives and the, and the Wisdom That Makes Us Whole. Divided Lives and the Wisdom That Makes Us Whole is the thread that runs throughout the book of James. And his diagnosis of the human condition is the tragedy of the divided heart. That we're double-minded across how we think and desire and act. Across the complexity of human existence, Jesus portrayed a startling duality. There's a broad way that leads to destruction and a narrow way that leads to life. We can call him Lord truly or falsely. Our lives are like houses built on a rock or on sand. Jesus, excuse me, James echoes this dichotomy. He says there's two ways of life. There's two kinds of wisdom. They have different sources and opposite outcomes. And so we can summarize this text in this way. True wisdom comes from God and produces a life of humility and peace. So that's what this section talks about that we just read. The true humility comes from God and it produces a life of humility and of peace. And so moving through this passage, we're going to discover the beauty of true wisdom. First of all, that wisdom is demonstrated by one's life in verse 13. Then the source and fruit of false wisdom in 14 through 16, and then the source and fruit of true wisdom in the last two verses. So let's begin with verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So how do we know that someone possesses the capacity to judge rightly in their life? Who demonstrates that they know the knowledge of how to live well and has the disposition to act according to that? James does not assess a, assess a claim to wisdom in terms of intellectual ability or knowledge. Rather, a wise person is known by good conduct. This pattern of behavior, this manner of life reveals wisdom. In other words, a wise individual manifests wisdom a beautiful life. I wonder if you've experienced uh, in your life personally the winsome nature 
of wisdom. In my first two years of college, uh, it didn't take me too long uh, to board the ship of fools, unfortunately. I was brimming with misguided, youthful hubris, seeking radical autonomy and reckless pleasure. I eventually found myself shipwrecked in the emptiness of a life that collapsed upon itself. By the grace of God, there were a number of Christians in the fraternity in which I lived whose wisdom manifested the very qualities that I longed for but was not able to find myself. And I had sought those in all the wrong places. These young men were unencumbered by the insecurity and the selfishness and the critical nature that plagued me. And I was drawn to their purposefulness and their joy, their humility, and the true loving nature that they have. I discovered that it was grounded in trusting and obeying Jesus Christ and embracing his wisdom. So the beauty of Jesus was revealed in the beauty of Christian character and community. And the fruit of my own foolishness became distasteful when compared to the fruit of true wisdom. And I wonder if you've had the opportunity to display the winsomeness of God's wisdom by the pattern of your own life and your character. Not in a grandiose, self-serving way, but in the humility of wisdom. So I wonder who might benefit in your circle of influence, like I did in the bungling confusion of my college years. Who could benefit from a mature demonstration from you of wisdom? James points out that the good conduct, the pattern of a well-lived life, is expressed in the meekness of wisdom. So this term meekness can be translated as gentle, as humble, or as meek. And it's not a passivity uh, out of weakness. That's a, this word meekness, I think, is confusing for a lot of us uh, in contemporary life, what it's come to mean. But it's not about passivity. It's not about being generated out of a weak nature. It's an active, deliberate acceptance while retaining strength. This word was used in training a horse. It's a magnificent, strong, powerful animal that is trained to submit to its leader, to its owner, or to its rider. And so that is the picture of meekness. Power under control. The meek Christian man or woman is under the loving control of the Spirit. In the next chapter, James reminds us That God is opposed to the proud and he gives grace to the humble. But the ancient Greek and Roman cultures did not prize meekness. They envisioned it as a kind of submissive giving in or relinquishing of oneself. It was not worthy of a strong or confident person to act that way. But the New Testament turns this notion on its head. In Christ's kingdom, strength and gentleness go together. Jesus himself claimed to be meek in Matthew 11. He blessed those who are meek in Matthew 5. The fear of the Lord, recognizing one's proper place in the created order and submitting to the Creator's instructions in daily life, this is the beginning of wisdom. And it shows itself in gentleness, in humility, in that rare kind of meekness. Having established that wisdom is demonstrated by one's life, particularly in good works done in humility, James turns our attention to a false kind of wisdom in verse 14. This is the second movement, which is the source and the fruit of false wisdom. He writes, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every kind of vile practice. There are two phrases really that are implicit in this verse, so it can really be read like this. But if you claim to be wise while at the same time have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about your so-called wisdom and be false to the truth. James recognizes two qualities that are antithetical to true wisdom. First of all is bitter jealousy. This is a self-oriented desire to to possess things that are not really ours. It includes abilities, material objects, or a station in life. 
And the fact that it's bitter reveals a posture of resentful competition. This is the opposite of grace. It's wanting to grasp rather than to give. It's motivated by one's own desires and needs rather than caring for others. This person has contracted the malignant cancer of comparison and their body is consumed by unfulfilled desires. This past Thursday evening, my wife Jan and I were having dinner uh, on our back uh, patio and we were just informally talking about this passage because I was going to be teaching on Sunday and we just landed on this topic of envy uh, and she thought, uh, she suggested, well, let's just think about our inventory of envy or, or where we've been in our life. So we just enjoyed tracing back and thinking of times, seasons of life where we felt disconnected or we felt underdeveloped or we felt behind of where we wanted to be or where we thought that we should be. And we remembered sometimes when we were in that condition, we longed for something that someone else had. And we found ourselves really in a position of envy. There were other times uh, where that wasn't the case and we were able to trust God with the situation. So I think um, that's a valuable thing to do. Maybe you can do that uh, yourself in a journal this week or with someone who's close to you, maybe in your small group. Just the idea of an envy inventory and to trace where God has led you through that in your own life. A second expression of false wisdom is selfish ambition. And this is a self-seeking attitude bent on gaining advantage and prestige for oneself. Yet the Bible does not condemn all forms of of ambition. It's not as if all human aspirations are corrupted out of hand. And this is a very important point. We read in 1 Thessalonians 4, instructs us to aspire to a quiet and productive life. 2 Corinthians 5 calls us to aspire to please the Lord. In Romans 15, 20, Paul aspires to preach Christ, to preach the gospel where Christ's name is not known. So godly ambitions are not to be suppressed. We should strive for a passion for social justice, the drive to pick up our cross daily and to lose our life in order to find it, to to aspire to a love that bears all things and believes all things and hopes all things and endures all things. James is targeting a prideful inner desire to promote oneself without reference to God or the needs of others. This disposition breeds restlessness. Contentment is elusive for the one who's attempting to catapult himself above his creator or those around him. James continues, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. Do not boast about your supposed wisdom, is what he's saying, if you're, because you're being dishonest with yourself. If gentleness, humility, and weakness have been overrun by envy and self-centeredness, then we're living a lie. We're claiming to be wise, but we're exhibiting a pattern that denies that very claim. The source of this pseudo-wisdom is now revealed in verse 15. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. We've seen how throughout his letter, James continually exposes our divided hearts. He says we are double-minded in how we think and desire and act. He wonders in previous chapters how we can be hearers of the word but not doers, that we possess faith but are devoid of good works, We bless God with our lips, but curse our neighbor. And now we have a division in wisdom as well. There's one kind of wisdom that comes from above. There's also a wisdom that comes from below. The mindset on the limited viewpoint of this world, ignoring God's realm and will, is a phantom wisdom. It's a false representation of authentic truth that comes down from the Lord. At the root of this so-called wisdom is what makes sense to the natural man. It is devoid of divine revelation. It is earthly. It's an expression of rebellion against the Lord. It's following in Satan's mistrust and his self-exaltation and his disobedience. It's demonic. The source of this pervasive false wisdom has been exposed. And what is its impact? 
Verse 16 tells us, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Jealousy and selfish ambition are ugly and active. They will express themselves in disorder and evil behavior, breaking out in relational discard and external transgression. Here, James is mirroring the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 12. Jesus said, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person, out of his good treasure, brings forth good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, brings forth evil. The word disorder here is the the common Greek word for anarchy or political turmoil. Every vile practice refers to worthless activity that cannot produce any real benefit. It's really reminiscent of the Apostle Paul's description in Galatians 5 of the works of the flesh. These are the natural, earthly, unspiritual expressions that are in opposition to the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Paul writes in Galatians 5, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Now did you catch in Paul's list the same categories that James mentions? Jealousy and envy. He said there's rivalries and dissensions and divisions. And that sounds an awful lot like disorder. And the rest of those qualities relate to every vile practice. So for a moment, I'd like you to step outside of the ancient biblical world, whatever you picture that to be, and consider your own personal relational world. And just think about, can a church, of which you're a part of here, or you're visiting, or we're glad that you're here. Can a church enjoy trust and respect and genuine care if the, its members are marked by selfishness and a jealous desire for what others have? What about the relationship the children have with their parents, or a husband and a wife, or roommates? What about at work, the teams that you belong to? What about the PTO? What about a homeschool co-op? What about a neighborhood association? Those people that you gather with and work alongside, what lubricates and solidifies these relationships? Some of you are active in an orchestra or a show choir or a sports team. What kind of attitudes and motives build up and what tears down? The kind of wisdom that you are allowing to inform you will be demonstrated in how you honor and respect the people around you. God is the source of beauty. This includes what makes a human soul wise, humble, and gentle. And out of that good treasure, it brings forth the capacity to create harmonious, healthy relationships. Now, of course, these two wisdoms with conflicting sources and contradictory outcomes have always been in opposition to one another because one is divine and the other is demonic. Therefore, the church, which is in the world but not of it, is surrounded by false wisdom. In other words, we live in an occupied country that is ruled by the darkened foolishness of Satan's rebellion against the love and the truth of God. This has never not been the case. But today, for the American church to be the pillar and the foundation of the truth, as Paul calls it in 1 Timothy, the church is going to have to be wise and courageous. The Lord has revealed His design for humanity, for us to fulfill under His authority, that what He values, we are to value. The care for the vulnerable the definition of our purpose and our identity, the sanctity of human life, the meaning and moral practice of sexuality, protecting and training the next generation. All these things are defined by God and are to be upheld by His people. The wisdom from above and the so-called wisdom from below are radically opposed to one another on these issues and other cultural concerns. The follower of Jesus, that's us, 
we're called to respond in the humility of Jesus Christ, emulating his example of boldness, speaking the truth in love, sacrificing oneself, and abiding in the Father to fulfill his will. In contrast to the defiant, unruly, and fractious pseudo-wisdom, James now turns his attention to that which comes from above. This is the third movement of the passage, the source and the fruit of true wisdom. Verse 17 reads, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. As you might recall, true faith in chapter 2 of James was identified by the quality of the life it produces. Faith produces good works. True wisdom possesses a similar dynamic. In verse 17, James unveils a cascade of magnificently attractive qualities that flow from embracing God's wisdom. This fruit of genuine wisdom boasts a unique flavor, unlike the bitter taste of envy and selfish ambition. Earlier this morning, we just uh, heard from Carly and described the journey uh, that she traveled, receiving from the Lord's hand really uh, a titanic loss at a very young age. And like all of us, she was on a path and she had to choose one way or the other. So what just a timely illustration of this passage for us, to, for her to tell her story today. And as she engaged with pain and with hurt and troubling questions about losing her mom, she had to be met with a cacophony of voices. She listened, though, to the one lone voice of wisdom from the Lord. And she embraced that. And the fruit of that is wisdom and joy and trust. And that is the beauty of true wisdom. But before we examine uh, the fruit of godly wisdom in verse 17, there's a nuance to wisdom that I think can be helpful uh, for us to examine. On the surface, we are drawn to godly wisdom. But underneath, we shield a quiet, selective antipathy to it. We are made in God's image as finite creatures. We're limited in knowledge, power, and scope. But we share his capacity to love, to reason, to communicate, to create, and to work. Due to the sin of our first parents, our nature is bent. It's twisted. We're rebellious to what is best for us. Although uniquely created in his like likeness, God's ways are not always our ways now. And this includes his wisdom. At times, his truth and design make complete sense, and we uphold it. But at other times, it's counterintuitive. It's counter to our nature and to our desires. The genuine test of following the wisdom from above is when we don't feel like doing it. We are attracted to the beauty of wisdom until we're not. So on a Sunday morning like this, we're hearing that we need to choose between true wisdom and foolishness disguised as wisdom. It's easy to convince ourselves that we want to and that we're going to follow God's will. But if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we reject his wisdom. In his classic work, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis provided some keen insight into this spiritual dynamic. So I'm going to read uh, what he wrote in Mere Christianity. I think you'll appreciate this. It should be on the screen as you follow along. The ordinary idea which we all have before we become Christians is this. We take as starting point our ordinary life with its various desires and interests. We then admit that something else, call it morality or decent behavior or the good of society, has claims on this self, claims which interfere with its own desires. What we mean by being good is giving in to those claims. But we're hoping all the time that when all the demands have been met, the poor natural self will still have some chance and some time to get on with its own life and do what it likes. In fact, we're very like an honest man paying his taxes. He pays them all right, but he does hope that there'll be enough left over for him to live on. Make no mistake, if you're really going to try to meet all the demands made on the natural self, it will not have enough left over to live on. The more you obey your conscience, the more your conscience will demand of you. And your natural self 
which is being starved and hampered and worried at every turn, will get angrier and angrier. The Christian way is different. Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I've not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and a branch there. I want to have the whole tree down. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't want to drill the tooth or crown it or stop it. I want to have it out. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires which you think innocent, as well as the ones you think wicked, the whole outfit. I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. My own will shall become yours. <coughs> Half measures will never, never do, Lewis says. <clears throat> I must go in all the way, trusting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, <clears throat> that his death on the cross pays the penalty for my sin, and then he gives me a new nature capable of desiring and following the beauty of wisdom. So returning to verse 17, James introduces these different qualities of wisdom. <clears throat> he says that very first, at the first, it is pure. And this is its basic characteristic. It's an innocence and a moral blamelessness that embraces all the other traits that are listed. This is an amazing quality to have clarity about what is good to long for that and to be able to achieve it. The next three terms, peaceable, gentle, and open to reason, are all linked by alliteration in the Greek text. They all begin with the same vowel and they all have the same ending, and they stand in contrast to the bitter spirit of competition, to self-ambition, and to boasting that mark worldly wisdom that described in verse 14. Peaceable is particularly significant because it comes at the head of the list and then it's being highlighted again in verse 18. This exhortation must be a high priority for James because the community he's addressing is struggling with quarrels, quarrels and with fights that he calls out in the next chapter. Next, this godly wisdom is considerate, meaning reasonable, gentle, fair-minded. It means being willing to yield and not quick to demand. We're to consider how we can mirror love's leniency rather than insisting on our rights instead according to the letter of the law. Open to reason means easily persuaded. This quality creates an environment of being willing to get along with others and deferring where appropriate. It's the opposite of obstinance. Wisdom from above forms a person who's full of mercy and good fruits. Mercy is a term for acts of undeserved kindness. Next, the quality of impartial marks the wise person. James is describing someone who does not show favoritism or discriminate unfairly. James concludes this cluster of characteristics with the word sincere. And this can be translated without hypocrisy. It means not playing a part. This is a stable, trustworthy, transparent person. And I wonder if you know anyone like that in your life who's sincere, consistent, dependable, refreshingly their true self across all the scenes and the stages on which they perform. It's such a blessing to have that kind of an anchor in your life. As the culmination of these two contrasting portraits, verse 18 says, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So embracing godly wisdom yields peace and righteousness for God's people. If you want a harvest of righteousness, what do you have to sow? So this time of year in the summer, we're all driving by fields, and we see crops. Might be corn, uh, might be soybeans. Uh, our church family, your family, you as an individual, are also producing a crop, as it were. So metaphorically, when people drive by, when they observe this church, who you are and how we act, uh, when they come and be with your family, when they walk into your apartment and visit with you, 
What crop do they see and do they experience? It's not sowing beans, it's not corn, right? What we are hoping is they see a harvest of righteousness. That they see conduct that's pleasing to God and that we're pursuing what is good and right that is clearly reminiscent of Jesus Christ himself. And what climate produces that kind of crop? Well, it's not bitterness, it's not self-seeking. It must be planted and cultivated by those who love and live in peace. So righteousness flourishes when God's people seek peace. God's family lives like this. And Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So, how do we wrap this up this morning? Well, James is masterful at exposing our divided hearts and in calling us to that path of wholeness. If we want to correctly apply truth to our lives, what do we do? Well, it's far superior, yet often foreign to my natural inclinations to pursue wisdom. I acknowledge that it replaces with beauty the ugliness that results when I give in to my lower nature. Yet I lack the moral capacity and to consistently <clears throat> choose godly wisdom. It's so hard to simply know and to do the right thing. So where does that leave me? Well, I long like that man who wants to jimmy himself open and be cleansed and restored to a clear and quiet mind. I want to have meaningful, trusting relationships in which I'm truly known and we honor and respect and trust and care for each other. I desire to know the wise God who thinks and feels and acts with good intention and integrity and can teach me to do the same. So this passage that we study today meets me right there and speaks to those very longings. So taking an entire landscape of the New Testament, this list that we've looked at today feels very familiar. Because the fruit of true wisdom isn't unlike the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Which then leads us to Jesus himself, the man free of a divided heart, the ultimate whole human. The qualities we studied in James 3 today, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, these are all descriptions of Jesus' character, the beauty of his holiness. Where does this leave us? Well, simply put, we cannot just true, choose true wisdom on our own. And that's the whole point. It's from above and outside of us. Our privilege and our joy are to receive his wisdom as one of his generous gifts. In this next chapter, chapter 4, which we'll study next week, James closes the circle by issuing these invitations. He says that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble and says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Submit, draw near, humble yourself. His wisdom awaits you, and the beauty that follows is yours to possess. Lord, we ask that you would give us that wisdom that you alone possess. It's a generous gift that's available to us. And Lord, we want to be the people who are open to receiving that, possess it with joy, and share it freely with those around us. In Christ's name, amen.